News about COVID-19 may make you feel anxious about seeking medical care, and you may be worried about your chances of catching the virus if you need to be admitted. However, delaying care can be life-threatening or lead to serious complications. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast brought to you by the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hederly, Senior Writer for AHA. In this podcast, Nancy Foster, Vice President for Quality and Patient Safety Policy at the AHA, is joined by Paul Skolnick, Chair of Medicine and an Infectious Disease Specialist at Carilion Clinic in Roanoke, Virginia, to discuss what patients should know about getting care in a hospital during a pandemic and the new practices and protocols hospitals and health systems are enacting to keep patients safe. Hello, I'm Nancy Foster, Vice President for Quality and Patient Safety for the American Hospital Association. With me today is Dr. Paul Skolnick, Chair of Medicine and an Infectious Disease Specialist at Carilion Clinic in Roanoke, Virginia. Dr. Skolnick, I know you are still managing and treating patients for COVID-19. Thanks so much for taking the time to share your story with us. You're welcome, Nancy. I'm pleased to share our story and hope others can benefit from our experience. I'm going to begin with a broad question about what patients and the public should know about getting care at a hospital or health system during a pandemic. I think there are several things that our patients should know about getting care in a health system during this pandemic. Early on during the pandemic, while we are still discovering things about SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, we really shut down operations to everything except emergency services. Since that time, and as we've learned more about the virus and how it's transmitted, how the illness presents, and other matters concerning asymptomatic infection and prevention of transmission, we started to ramp up and open our hospital to non-emergent services, including some prioritized elective surgeries, outpatient visits, and the like. We've done that in very safe ways, implementing on both the inpatient and outpatient side practices that help to protect our patients and our staff and our community. Well, and as you know, infection prevention is not new to hospitals. Patient safety has long been the number one priority for hospitals. With that said, we know that safety protocols have become even more stringent during this pandemic. Can you share some examples with us of some of those new practices you have put in place to make sure that your healthcare workers and your patients are safe as they come for care? So you're absolutely correct that through the decades, we have dealt with other infections that have spread either in epidemic form or pandemic form. Some of these are seasonal, such as influenza, which is also transmitted by droplets. So it's well known how to prevent that sort of transmission. The way we do it is, number one, by identifying patients as best we can, either through testing or screening questions about contact with others who might have COVID-19 limiting access to those who are symptomatic or actively able to transmit the infection, and then using proper personal protective equipment, or PPE, to limit the spread of this infection, especially in the well-regulated and controllable hospital environment. It's much more difficult to do this in the community within the hospitals we have control of every aspect of care from the time that a patient and or a visitor encounters our health system at the door where we're giving screening questionnaires and taking temperatures to mandating that everyone wear a mask while they're in any one of our facilities and that includes staff, employees, physicians, visitors and patients to wearing the proper 
personal protective equipment over and above that, to cohorting patients on the inpatient side, to managing surgeries in particular ways to limit spread, and on the outpatient side, making sure that we flow patients through the system to limit or eliminate waits in waiting areas and exit and entrance flow patterns that will keep the distancing between patients and supplying multiple opportunities for hand washing. So the basic principles of always wear a mask, socially distance at least six feet between the next person, and frequent washing of hands are the bedrock principles to keep people safe, both in the community and in the hospital. In the hospital, we're just able to do that with extra safeguards and even more rigorously than one might be able to do that in the community. That's great. That's great information for everyone. Um, and you even anticipated my next question, which was going to be um, what, what might look different when a patient comes to the hospital uh, to, to receive care. Is there anything else you think we should mention um, about uh, what's different or what's different in appearance uh, when a patient uh, comes to the hospital? Yeah, I'd be happy to walk you through maybe a, a scenario in the outpatient setting and one on the inpatient setting. Keep in mind that what I'm about to say are general principles and the actual procedures and the details of those procedures may vary from hospital to hospital. However, the basic ideas will carry through the various settings. Here at Carilion Clinic, for instance, on the ambulatory or outpatient side, we have multiple primary care practices. We have subspecialty clinics in all the surgical and medical subspecialties. Lots of different venues where we encounter patients. So, for example, it starts way before the patient ever comes to see us. We've ramped up our telemedicine in profound ways with video visits and telephonic calls and interactions so that we can care for people where, when it's possible without them coming to our healthcare facilities. However, another paradox of this pandemic is that people who really need to come see us for a myriad of reasons have health problems that need in-person attention haven't been coming to us. So we need those people to understand we are open for business and please come see us with all the safety precautions we have in place. Those include pre-registration before ever coming to our facility. So the more typical old way of doing this in person is eliminated. Elimination of waiting room areas when possible people waiting in cars until their turn comes to come into the clinic and see the physician, or if we do utilize a waiting area, making sure that things are spaced appropriately and then everyone has a mask on. Doing things in the examination rooms that might have been done at a front office desk previously, those are now segregated into the individual exam rooms the conduct of the examination with both the patient and the provider wearing appropriate PPE, which often and always includes face masks, but often face shields, and in certain situations, gowns and gloves. And then after the visit, making sure that the exiting from the ambulatory or outpatient space, whether that be an office or an urgent care area, is done with the proper social distancing. There are many other things that we have in place, but that gives you an example of the kinds of things that we might do for someone who needs in-person health care. On the inpatient side, we have screening questionnaires and limited entry points where the questions are asked, temperatures are taken, and masks are provided if needed so that everyone is starting in the same place in terms of protecting each other. Wearing masks, remember, protects your neighbor. So that's the public health aspect of this. 
love thy neighbor, wear that mask so you don't spread infection to others. And if everyone has a mask, that cuts down dramatically on the transmission rate. We can talk more about that in a while, Nancy, if you'd like to. Once you're in the hospital, you'll go directly, typically, to your care area where we have the same sort of pre-registration going on before arrival and methods to have patients flow through the inpatient area in a way that limits contact with others. And our staff is going to be wearing appropriate PPE when they're caring for you. For people coming in for surgical procedures here at Carillion, and this varies across the country, but here at Carillion, we have pre-procedure testing for COVID-19 that all patients receive prior to coming to the facility for surgery. Obviously, I'm talking about elective procedures here. This doesn't include emergent procedures, which we handle in a different way. But we take the same care no matter what the type of procedure, so we know ahead of time what we're dealing with in terms of the presence or absence of COVID-19, and we can protect everyone appropriately. Thank you, Dr. Skolnick. I, I would like to drill down on two things you spoke about. One, when you were talking about the ambulatory surgeries, not surgeries, ambulatory services, uh, you cautioned that people should be coming in uh, to get their health needs met and not just let them go. We've seen some disturbing uh, reports lately that people may be ignoring their own health symptoms in, even in an emergency. We know emergencies don't stop even during a pandemic. So what would be your advice about the uh, if they experience an emergency and how is Carillion working to keep them safe in the emergency department? So Nancy, those are really important points. In the ambulatory setting, it is clear that there are health problems where we need patients to come in and see us. The tiny risk of coming to a healthcare facility with all the protections we have in place are far outweighed by the major risks of letting certain health problems go without proper care. And this has been well documented. It's in multiple fields that we see in the hospital from things that deal with the heart, to things that deal with cancer, to things that deal with surgical problems, and, and on and on. For emergent situations, either for those who think they must go to an urgent care setting or to our emergency department, please, please come in and see us. We have multiple things in place to make sure that your visit to us is safe. For instance, in Carilion Clinic's emergency departments, we have all the things I already talked about in terms of screening ahead of time, but if you arrive without any of that, which is often the case, we have ways to interact with you that the interaction is just with you and you're not in a waiting area or exposed to many others. We take people directly back into these individual rooms which have the proper airflow and all the other protections that are needed and based on that preliminary screening and registration, we quickly determine the best way to care for you and, uh, and then the proper setting to care for you within the emergency department proper. We also have access to rapid testing for COVID-19 if and when that's needed, so we know again who might be infected and who is not. And then we have very skilled providers, nurses, doctors, x-ray te technicians, phlebotomists, the list goes on, who, again, are trained and know the best ways to protect the patient and to protect the rest of the staff. We've gone, and other hospitals have gone, to extraordinary lengths to educate all of our employees to know how to do that so it's sec second nature for them. I wanted to ask you about one other point you made, which was around the masks. Um, you pointed out that wearing a mask keeps your neighbor safe. Could you explain that a little bit more? And, uh, and quite frankly, mask wearing has become somewhat controversial in some parts of the country. Could you help us understand why it's so important? 
I'd be happy to, Nancy. And this is a critical point. This not only relates to what we're talking about in the hospital setting, but in the community. The first thing to know about mask wearing is that is one of three precautions that are key to preventing spread in the community. So along with social distancing, six feet distancing in the settings where there could be transmission, and good hand washing, wearing of masks is critical. We know this. There, there are many ways that we know this. One way is in those cultures where mask wearing is part of the norm, such as Japan, South Korea, those countries have had much lower death rates from COVID-19. And it's because everyone's wearing a mask and less infection is being transmitted. We also know it by analogy to other infections that are spread by droplets through the air. And in these situations, mask wearing has been proven to decrease the risk of transmission. Wearing of masks is about public health. It's not about politics. It's about protecting your neighbor. That's what I meant by love thy neighbor. And it's about protecting your community. It does have also financial implications because our ability to open all sorts of venues, be it restaurants or other types of facilities, is only possible if we can have decreasing rates of infection, low rates of infection, the ability to identify infection and contact trace. Without the use of masks, we lose our ability to do that classic infection control activity that's critical to interrupting and ending the pandemic. So my, my uh, wish and hope is that everyone will reinforce each other's use of masks. And if you see someone who's not wearing a mask when they should be, take the time to gently remind that person that it would be nice if they put a mask on. And hopefully through this collective effort, we'll be able to increase our use of mask usage and make it a public health issue and certainly not a political issue. Thanks so much for sharing that important information for people, fact-based information. Um, Dr. Skolnick, I want to shift gears just a little bit and ask you about how Carillion is communicating with its community about the fact that you're open for business and safe and effective and that you have perhaps some additional opportunities to treat patients through means such as telehealth. Um, could you share a little bit with us about that? Sure, happy to do so. Um, we have multiple modalities, as you might expect, by which we're trying to get this word out to the community. One very uh, potent way to do this is between patient and provider. So over time, patients have developed trust with their providers. And those conversations where a provider will say to a patient, please come in and see me. I think you need to come in and see me for the following reasons. Those go a long way to reassuring people that it's safe for this to happen. And the providers know and, and need to know all the precautions that are being taken in their particular areas. Another way that we do it is public service messages uh, by our providers or others in our uh, organization that are shown and heard across media, social media, television, radio, to allow people to understand some of the precautions that we're taking to help them keep safe and feel safe. Um, some of this is understanding the fear that some people have developed, and understandably so, about this infection and knowing that this infection can be severe, helping people to balance risks. That's something we do without thinking every day when we get into a car to drive somewhere. Whatever it is that we happen to be doing, we are always evaluating risks by giving people information about the low risk of coming to a healthcare facility 
balanced against the high risks of not getting appropriate medical care, we hope to allay people's fears and concerns and have them come in to get the necessary care. Can I, can I dig a little bit deeper into your new telehealth platform? Um, how has that worked for Carillion? Is it, has it been popular with your patients? Um, has it been useful? How do you see that going forward? This has been one of the wonderful side benefits to the current situation. There are a few, but this is one of them. We had to very quickly ramp up our already significant telemedicine abilities and telehealth abilities to much greater uh, depth and, and availability. So we probably stood up additional services in the space of weeks in what had probably been planned to, to occur over months or even a couple of years. So our ability to render telephone, telephonic interactions with patients and video interactions with patients is really significant at this point. And for some things, that is perfectly adequate. Um, we have to, of course, educate our providers. We have to educate our patients to do this properly. There's a whole tech technological component that is needed to do this well and properly. Um, there are still some challenges. We happen to have our healthcare facility in the southwestern part of Virginia, so we serve, in addition to our urban areas, some rural areas, and we have the um, lack of internet service in some of those locations, which makes things difficult. But for the most part, our patients are able to utilize these services and utilize them well with our help and with some prodding. There are age differences, as you can imagine. Sometimes our younger or uh, middle-aged patients are more tech-savvy than our older patients. But even with our older patients, we can almost always walk them through what this might entail and get that up and running when the need arises. So uh, lastly, I'll mention that another aspect of this is that the government and the health insurance companies during these times have reimbursed some of these telehealth activities at a rate commensurate with in-person visits. And that has given us the resources and the ability to do this and roll this out in a very robust way. We're hopeful that this telehealth capability will continue as we go forward and that all the resources and support that we need to continue this are given to us uh, going forward. That's great. Could you give me just a little bit more insight in, are you using the telehealth to help monitor and treat COVID patients, um, other types of patients? What, what kinds of patients has it been most successfully use, used on? There's a large variety of patients for whom we use the telehealth visits. Um, these range from well patient care to management of some chronic illnesses that may be of mild or moderate severity to some follow up with uh, COVID positive patients who have been discharged from the hospital. So it, it, it really spans the horizon of medical patients, surgical patients, psychiatric patients. Our psychiatric services have made huge use of telemedicine services, and that's been a real win for everyone concerned. Those are just some examples of, of the types of patients that we've able to uh, utilize telehealth. It sounds like telehealth is among the many services that Carillion and other health systems are providing that are incredibly useful, incredibly helpful to the patient and safe in this current environment. We know right now a hospital's emergency department is among the safest places you can step into um, anywhere in the world. And if you need to do so, please don't allow unwarranted fear of COVID-19 to prevent you from getting the medical attention you need and deserve. Hospitals and health systems will continue to do our part for you 
as Dr. Skolnick has just described, but we need the public to do their part for us. Stay home, socially distance when you do go out, and wear a mask, as Dr. Skolnick has advised, so we can protect each other um, from this awful disease. Dr. Skolnick, so, I want to thank you so much for providing your insights and your experience to our listeners. Thank you, Nancy. My pleasure to do so.